My name is Lisa Griebel, and I am a 15-year sarcoma survivor. You know, it was the fall of 2005 when I went to my hairdresser for my regularly scheduled emergency haircut. And Jan and I got to talking about a mutual friend of ours who had just recently been diagnosed with breast cancer and kidney cancer. So we were in the middle of that conversation and uh, Jan stopped and said, uh, you know, it's gotten bigger. And, and she was referring to this lump that I had on the back of my neck that, you know, for the last couple years, every time I would see my doctor for whatever reason, I would ask about it and was told, oh, it's nothing. It's just a fatty tumor. It's nothing to be worried about. No big deal. And when Jan said that it had started to grow, which I would never have noticed, of course, um, and in the context of the conversation that we were having about cancer, I decided that I needed to get another checkup. So I went back to my primary doctor. She said she thought I should go consult with a surgeon. So I did. And he referred me to yet another surgeon who referred me thankfully to Dr. Ed Chang at the University of Minnesota. So I finally got to the right doc who, again, wasn't necessarily convinced that this was cancer, but he suggested a surgical biopsy. And so that's what I did. And two weeks after the, um, the biopsy, I went back for the follow-up checkup and he, uh, said, you know, there's good news and bad news. The good news is that the incision is healing quite nicely. And uh, the pathology report came back saying that you have fibrosarcoma. And I remember, you know, I was sitting on the, um, the table and I had a book on my lap that had a lot of papers that I had shoved in there because, you know, it was just going to be a routine appointment. and. Um, I remember leaning forward and asking him to repeat that because it was hard to understand what he was saying. And the book, I could see it falling in slow motion on the floor with papers flying everywhere. And it was just this hearing the words fibrosarcoma, which I had no idea what that meant, that um, was pretty scary. And he kept talking and talking about radiation, oncology, all these other appointments, more surgery. And it was, um, it was very confusing. And I was alone, so I, I didn't have anybody to process the information with. It was a long um, journey and it was one that was filled with lots of angst, lots of um, fear, and um, I guess the other thing that I remember, and it's of course been 15 years, I remember just being so grateful for having surrounded myself with loving and caring friends and, and family that, that really stepped up and helped me through this um, difficult time. And it was during that time that um, I learned about an organization called Rain and Sarcoma that just happened to be in Minnesota. And I reached out to them and, and wanted to connect with the organization and was all set to go to that year's party in the park. Um, but unfortunately, it was one of the, the very few party in the park events that had basically a monsoon <laughs> happening. And um, 
So I didn't go that year, but I made a commitment that I would stay connected to the organization because um, they uh, were helpful with information and additional support. And I became a volunteer the following year and have worked with them ever since. Well, I think at the time of my diagnosis, I wasn't aware of renin and sarcoma. And I, um, I didn't realize all the resources that they had available until after I had been through all of my treatments. And it was at that point that I connected and, you know, I, everything is always clearer in hindsight. Um, I, I was just overwhelmed by the number of resources that they had available. And um, again, when I connected with Rain and Sarcoma, um, it was still a very young organization. And now it's been around for more than 20 years. And I am absolutely blown away by the kind of resources that they have available now to people that are newly diagnosed in um, or with sarcoma. And I think what I really value and appreciate about this organization is that it is on a path to continuously build the um, the resources available to people, whether they be human resources or um, the website is phenomenal with the um, just all of the information that's available. And I think the other thing that has grown significantly and is incredibly valuable to our um, patients and families are the, the number of events, the number of um, opportunities people have to get involved in the organization. And it's still very much a patient-run organization. So we have very little professional staff, but um, it is the, the, the survivors, the patients, the um, families, the loved ones that have gotten involved in the organization that are really um, making the uh, decisions about what we can offer and the value that we can offer to other people so that they don't have to go through the experiences that we've been through in the past. But they do have this incredible guidebook that is um, filled with all kinds of information, very valuable information for newly diagnosed patients. And it helps people um, figure out the um, kind of what needs to be done and it takes a really proactive approach. So I think it, what it, how it can help is that it um, lays everything out that you need to do. It gives you a schedule that you can, that allows you to keep track of the doctor's appointments and, and what happened um, during these um, doctor's appointments and what's the next, what's the next step in the process. And, um, you know, I wish that I would have had that when I when I first got my diagnosis, but it um, it wasn't available then. And now I know that this is an incredible resource for other people. I um, value friendship and I value family a lot. And maybe it's because I've always been a single person that I have to rely on other people. Um, and I make my own family out of my friends. And um, I, I remember um, well, one of, the, one of the things that I think is pretty common about people when they first get their cancer diagnosis is they don't want to talk to anybody about it. And I've seen this pattern with, with several friends that have gone through getting their cancer diagnosis. 
And so it's just, it starts with a really small group of people that you really tell because, I mean, I was still trying to figure out what this meant. And so I told my inner circle, you know, my, some family members and um, a few friends, and they in turn um, stepped up and came back to me with ways in which they wanted to help me. And again, just not being the kind of individual that asks for a lot because of my high independence, I, I found that the fact that people were coming to me and offering to bring me food or to clean my house or to do my garden or these kinds of things, what it did is it just allowed me to be able to relax into the, the diagnosis and the self-care. And that was really, um, that was really important. So the idea that I could actually ask for help and people would follow through, I think it just helped my healing process tremendously. And that un was another one of the key learnings that I had in this whole process. And one that I've actually, over the years, have been able to um, continue to cultivate and to nurture. And what it has also taught me is that now I can also give back to other people. And that's become a huge part of my, um, I guess my journey is, is to be able to offer help and assistance to other people that are in going through difficult times. And that has helped me continue to grow and develop and heal myself. I did my research by talking to other people that either had experienced cancer, not necessarily sarcoma, but had been through cancer treatments and could talk about the impact of radiation um, treatments, could talk about um, what it was like to um, go through the, th I went through three surgeries and just the recovery process, what was that going to look like? And um, so I relied a lot on people, conversations, um, and I tried to stay away from the internet because it was too scary and I didn't want to go there. <laughs> I've become a tea drinker, <laughs> so that for sure is uh, one thing. I, um, I'm conscious of, of diet, I'm conscious of exercise, so yes, I do walk anywhere from um, three to five miles a day, regardless of what the weather is doing outside. Um, I have pets which I think is really important because there's just something about having those creatures around us that are very healing. Um, I have done yoga and meditation. I've in incorporated that into um, my practice in the past and I have found that to be incredibly helpful. Um, one of the most important parts of my self-care journey, I, I put it into this container called time and space, that I, I give myself more time and I allow myself more space to make decisions. Um, and I find that it, what that has done is it, slow, it has slowed down my pace. And so, I have um, done a lot to reduce the stress level in my life. Um, and I think all of those things have contributed to it. And I make it a regular practice to get massage. <laughs> and um, 
So it's the, I mean, it's the little things. And I do my, my um, journal, I, I keep a journal, and um, I like to create beautiful things with my hands. And I find all of these things just contribute to my um, creativity, contribute to my healing, contribute to my ability to connect with other people and make friends. And all of that makes my life very good right now. One of the things that I did that year, in fact, I, I went back to my calendar to, to figure out when this was, but I, um, I was not working at the time. And I remember a friend talking or telling me about the fact that he was going to be going to India with a group of people from an organization in the, in the Twin Cities to, um, Well, it, it, was a, it was a trip with a nonviolent peace organization in the Twin Cities, and it was, um, it just sounded like such a cool trip. It was going to be a two-week vacation, well, vacation, and um, I really, I love third, third world countries. And, and so I thought, well, I, I really want to experience India because it's Eastern culture and and just go. So I had to get clearance from all of my docs before I left, but this was, uh, I think, five months after the treatments. And it was a phenomenal experience because um, it's a very spiritual culture. And we spent time in Dharamsala, which is where the Tibetan government in exile lives. And that's a very spiritual place. And um, I just remember sitting with a, a woman who was a physician there that hadn't seen, I, she, I don't think she had seen the, because I have a big hole in my <laughs> I have a big hole in the back of my head. She didn't see that, but you know, she checked my pulse. This is part of Eastern medicine and was able to tell me that the cancer has completely left my body. And um, that was a pretty powerful experience. I'm Cara Dalmi. I am a sarcoma survivor of three and a half years. My sarcoma story started nearly 10 years ago when I found a bruise on my left hand that was unexplainable, then turned into a lump that gradually grew over time. I ignored it for several years because it did not affect the functioning of my hand and it didn't hurt. My family finally encouraged me to reach out to my doctor and he referred me to Dr. Thomas who conducted an initial biopsy that was inconclusive. The most we found was that it had come back shortly thereafter. I had a second biopsy that also came back inconclusive. Dr. Thomas explained to me that the next procedure could be quite debilitating to my hand, and so he wanted to refer me to the Mayo Clinic to determine the next best steps My first thought was, and experience was relief. I had gone into this procedure worried that I was going to have lost potential large amounts of functioning in my hand for something that could be benign and unnecessary. So I initially was very relieved and then it was figuring out what do you do next or what do I do next? I met with Dr. Moran and Dr. Hodek who following review of an MRI and my history determined that a wide resection surgery was the best option for me. That was scheduled for May 23rd of 2018. Following that surgery, it was determined that I had a rare form of myxoid sarcoma of the left hand. Dr. Hodek was able to receive wide margins 
and completely remove the cancer. That left Dr. Moran to completely reconstruct my hand to restore as much function as possible. One of my primary forms of self-care was running. I was a runner prior to this time, and I think every time following a surgery, my first question to my surgeon would be, when is the next time that I can run? Whether I had a big cast on my sleeve or not. Um, also utilizing family, friends, um, therapy myself, and um, Although I did not see at the time, always see at the time um, that God was there or present in this journey, I can look back and see how there is no way I could am where I am at today without having my faith. I would say that my relationships with some of my friends got closer, and I really knew who was going to be there for me or who was going to um, listen, understand. Um, and I actually would say, I feel as though my relationship with myself got stronger. I'm not naturally a person who is very compassionate and kind to myself and has had a journey of figuring out how to do that. And when you are at the lowest of lows is when I found that is when you often find a way to be kindest to yourself. I have more confidence, self-confidence, and I have more um, compassion for myself than I think I've had in a long time. I wish I would have known about brain and sarcoma sooner. It was so confusing. There was not even a lot of information about how to get support as an adult going through cancer. There is a lot of supports out there for kids going through cancer and it just felt lonely and confusing. And sarcoma really, brain and sarcoma really um, just felt like I had a community and I had some, some answers. How I support my families and my kids and helping them understand their journey of healing that helped me to be even more patient with myself in, in this journey as well. So I'm Connor O'Brien and I'm a three-year rhabdomyosarcoma survivor. And rhabdomyosarcoma is a pe pediatric soft tissue sarcoma. Usually it consists of undeveloped skeletal uh, cells. So mostly kids. Uh, I think 90% of cases are children from zero to four. Somehow I was the lucky one to get the late onset version. I was diagnosed in the fall of 2018 and what happened was previous to that I was mostly asymptomatic, had really no idea um, anything w was happening. There's, there's a few things in hindsight but um, I was at a medical conference while I was eating lunch I got the sensation that I was choking, but I could still breathe. It was very strange. And uh, I ended up going to the bathroom, and <laughs> that's what I had uh, the, the beginning uh, of my journey. And basically, I uh, started hemorrhaging blood out my mouth. Very strange. Um, but I was supposed to speak on a panel later that day, so I was like, I'm going to be fine. Just got to walk this one off. So I paced for 15 minutes and it didn't stop bleeding and I realized that uh, probably need to get to the hospital as soon as possible. So I ended up taking a lift from the convention center to Hennepin Healthcare in downtown Minneapolis and got to the ER and got there just in time before I passed out. I woke up and they told me we see a large mass in, in your throat in the base on the base of my tongue. So. Obviously, we did a lot of testing. They said they weren't sure what it was. Could be benign, could be a cyst. The cancers that they usually see there, um, it definitely wasn't one of those. And um, really, they hadn't. They really hadn't encountered uh, what it ended up being. And that's often the case with different uh, with different sarcomas. Three days in, I stayed in the ICU. I ended up having to get biopsied. Went home, had to wait for about two weeks, and I got the call two weeks later from my ENT on my way to my brother's birthday party. 
And, uh, you know, they told me that they were in for a little bit of surprise. I have rhabdomyosarcoma. That's how I kind of, that's how I kicked off uh, my entire cancer treatment. Basically, I was put on a pediatric protocol, which consisted of 14 rounds of chemotherapy. And I ended up doing uh, radiation as well as a partial glycectomy where they removed a, a part of my tongue to remove the tumor. Over the course, the entire treatment took about 11 months. Um, but the, the thankful part is, is that at the end of it, they were able to get a full resection completely removed and very luckily, it, I actually had caught the tumor very early due to the location and it ended up being stage one, grade one, which is the lowest risk group for this particular um, type of sarcoma. And I have been cancer free since, uh, since the end of treatment and very, very lucky for me. For sarcomas in general, getting the right oncologist, very important. Um, a lot of doctors may have very few um, encounters with different sarcomas and the protocol and when things happen and happening, um, making sure they happen in the right sequence, incredibly important for a positive outcome. And I can't tell you how many patients I've spoken to where that's not always the case. So getting a great care team around you, very important in the beginning, even when it's the most difficult um, time to, um, to walk through that. I'm very lucky that one time my family is almost low in healthcare. Um, so when I encountered my oncologist and I was told up front, hey, this guy's one of the best in the world. But we did reach out to other oncologists uh, you know, across the country. And we, once again, I was very fortunate that I have a family that had the ability to do that and the know-how of what to even ask of a doctor. Um, but very quickly, we settled on him. For my care team in general, you know, I would see him obviously monthly throughout the course of my treatment. I could spend days um, singing the praises of the oncology nurses and all the other staff there and you know how kind and how helpful they were for each and every appointment. The other person on my team was uh, my doctor's PA who actually handled almost half of my appointments. So she would do my checkup, she would sometimes um, you know, go through the results of my scans, check on how I'm doing, um, you know, give me my prescriptions. And I, I couldn't say enough about her. She was the exact same age as me. Didn't even learn that till the very end, just because her level of maturity and what she brought um, um, as part of my treatment was absolutely incredible. It still blows my mind um, when, when I think about it. So those were... The main, I mean, those two, um, my primary oncologist and his PA would handle 90% of my treatment for the first, um, let's say, six to seven months. Now, I was also very fortunate that I, I moved back home with my parents and our local hospital was also extremely helpful and willing to provide little things to make sure I didn't have to drive back to the Twin Cities each and every you know, um, time I needed my port removed or chemo big switched out and, and things of that nature. And also they treated my neutropenic uh, fevers. Um, and they're very collaborative, reaching out to my oncologist and my team. Even when I think back, it was really incredible um, how much they were able to collaborate. And once again, when I reached one of the most important parts of my treatments, my doctor, and this is a human thing, he got to a place where he was like, I'm not really sure what we should do next, but there's, a, there's another doctor I want you to see and let's get you in. I'm gonna make a personal call to get him to squeeze you into the schedule within a few days. Pretty incredible, um, I think, and in how collaboratively they worked. And on top of that, once again, I was in a fortunate position that my family that worked in healthcare, um, they kept careful track of every single appointment and what was happening and the effects on me and um, you know keeping close track of me throughout my entire treatment and that was so incredible um, just because it was it enabled me to focus on myself and getting through the day knowing that I don't have to worry about if a doctor is going to miss something or something's going to sneak up like my mom my aunts my grandma um, they were on top of it 24-7. So the five stages of grief, did I experience them? Absolutely. Um, it just wasn't a linear thing. You know, it was all over the place at different times and different parts of my treatment. So at the beginning, yeah, I, um, 
it was an incredible amount of grief and anger um, about why this had happened to me. Um, and that was really hard. And I think that's what a lot of patients go through. Um, but I remember very specifically about three weeks into my treatment and I, it was a conversation all in my head. But I remember the moment and I said to myself, Connor, this, your treatment's gonna go one or two ways, the way you want it or the way you don't want it. But you're doing everything in your power um, possible to make to have make a good outcome happen. But until then, you can't spend a whole year feeling sorry for yourself. So I literally told me from today on, no more feeling sorry for myself. It is what it is. Why me? Yeah, it sucks, but it has to be somebody. You're one of the ones. Um, and honestly, that was, it was a big turning moment for me. And throughout the course of my treatment though, there's always still <sighs> emotional mountains and valleys. As far as exercise, one thing I did ask my, my oncologist on the very first appointment, I was like, what can I do to be proactive and you know make this go better? And he's like, walk 20 minutes a day, no matter what. He's no matter what, how you feel, every single day, 20 minutes. And my parents got a treadmill, put it in the room, and I did that uh, my entire treatment. And honestly, like 20 minutes a day doesn't sound like much, um, especially when you're healthy, but it was so helpful. Um, I thought just to have that thing to do um, and you know on the there's gonna be another piece of advice a patient told me is like you're gonna have really bad days it's gonna happen and there's some days that like you're gonna barely be able to get out of bed and that's fine don't feel bad about it nap as much as you can just do what you got to do um, and so you know that's the best advice uh, I can give there after my treatment, you know, I got back to a really good nutritional plan and, and working out and, and taking care of myself to the best of my ability. But, you know, during treatment, let's, you know, do, do what you can when you can. That's, uh, that's my best advice. Into my treatment when I got to a mental place where you know, I had a plan of action, I was in treatment, there was good signs. That's when I finally was able to start doing a deep dive. Um, uh, into sarcomas and I started off with an incredibly helpful handbook that radiant sarcoma had provided me which was a great overview and I did the one thing that they always tell you not to do I as a survivor will tell you not to do it you're gonna do it anyways because nobody can help themselves but don't Google don't ever Google and even if you do Google when you when you are because everyone does try to get off it as fast as you can taking in the amount of information that you can handle and that's best for you that is the correct path. Here's what I tell all new patients. The life you had, in a lot of ways, is over. With this experience, it fundamentally changes you. It's a fork in the world. Um, now, you can make of that any, um, what you will. Um, I, I do not feel like a cancer patient I work with cancer at each and every single day. That is my career. Um, what I feel like is I look back on this experience and I think of it as the strength and endurance that comes from trials and dirt. And when I get into hard situations, I think back, well, I already went through this. What, how does this situation compare to that? When I have a tough conversation or a tough meeting at work, I think about, well, remember when you walked into an oncologist's office and they told you they might cut your tongue out? That didn't happen. And oftentimes the worst case scenario doesn't. So as much as you can lean into that and start thinking about the life I had is over, but I can start building a new life for myself, that's the kind of, that's the attitude um, that I've taken. And it's been extremely helpful and positive for me. And that's the advice I would give to, to any patient. Um, what you had is done, but that doesn't mean um, you can't have the future you want either. It's easy if you dive into cancer research to get very, let's say, nihilistic or disappointed. But for me, when I look at it, over the course of 30 years, when you have brought the cure rate for even, you know, uh, maybe 500 patients are diagnosed per year, but you have a cure rate now of let's just say above 50% oftentimes for, for many patients, the amount of lives saved and, you know, that's, it's not just a number, it's, it's birthdays, it's life events, it's relationships, it's, it's everything. And that's over the course of three decades, my lifetime, very short span that all that has happened. 
And I find it incredibly inspiring. Um, and that's what I want to do with Rain and Sarcoma. And that's why I joined, because if this work hadn't been done 30 years ago, who knows what would have happened with me. So I want to pay it forward for the patients that will be diagnosed today, tomorrow, and over the course of the next 30 years, hopefully, and beyond. Getting cancer was the worst case scenario. Worst thing that ever happened to me, probably, you know, one of my worst nightmares and you know, treatment was at times torturous. It was a very difficult experience. But in a lot of ways, um, on the other side of it, it's been absolutely incredible. Now when I wake up and I think back about that year, it's like a bad dream. Like sometimes I think about it and I'm like, I can't even believe that even happened. Um, but it's, it's like a good, it's a good feeling. Your journey is unique. It might feel hard. It might feel overwhelming. It might feel exhausting. And yet, do not give up. You are worth it. And in any way you can, find ways to do things intentionally that make you feel alive throughout your, your treatment and your experience. I had to stop what I was doing and um, ask for help, which is really difficult for an incredibly uh, independently minded person. Um, but I knew that I couldn't do it alone. And I knew that I needed to rely on other people to help me and to trust that uh, everything was going to work out the way that it needed to work out. The day I was diagnosed, I was super fortunate. My great aunt is an osteosarcoma survivor, 50 years. And she, was, uh, she used to be the oncology director for a large HMO out in the, the Northwest. And she called me and she said, Connor, not gonna lie, you are about to be in for an incredibly difficult year. Chemotherapy, radiation, and everything they're going, they, um, that they're gonna need to do. And I just wanna level with you. You are in for an incredibly tough journey, but there is, you have options. And for a lot of people, that's not the case. Um, you have options, they, you have a plan in place. So now what you need to do is focus on how do you, how do you get through that for the next year and, what you need to do, and this is what I told me and what I did, which um, worked out incredibly well, is you need to dramatically shorten your, your time perspective. And it was one of, those, one of those really strange things when, before I got diagnosed, you know, you spend all this time thinking about your plans, what you want to do, and so many other things. And as soon as I got diagnosed, that was right out the window. And basically, you need to shorten your time horizon to how do I get through this day? When I wake up, what do I do to get out of bed, take my first few steps, do this just to get through the day? And you do that, and you do it again and again and again for weeks, turning into months. But eventually, you wake up one day and it's over. Um, and, and that was my experience. And so that's what I tell patients all the time, like reduce the big picture to nothing, smallest picture you can. If, as you know, it's not, it's impossible not to worry about things, not to wondering what the course of treatment and what the effects will be. But honestly, as much as you can stop yourself from thinking about it and just focus on the day and shorten your time horizon, that's how I got through my experience. And I did that for a whole year. And, um, you know, I, I thought I handled it very well. So that's probably the best advice I can give.